So the question here is that going back to the idea about the great sheikh or sheikha, because there are also women, and in fiqh there are a lot of women, by the way, and some of the greatest muftis of all were women. But you know, when we look at the great sheikh theory, um, of course, how does a man or a woman become a great sheikh? That's not what you're asking about, but that's essentially accomplishment. That they are regarded to be highly accomplished men and women with great knowledge and with superior teachers. Okay, so they have teachers and then they are accomplished students of those teachers. That gives them their authority. But your question is trust. In other words, how do I know that I can trust this great sheikh, right? To give me the tradition the way it ought to be. It's not an infallible person after all. Maybe they make a mistake. Maybe they don't have what I think they have. And this is a problem, of course, with qualified people wherever you have qualified people. How do you know that your doctor is actually a doctor? How do you know that your dentist knows what she's doing? How do you know that uh, the person doing your income taxes is not going to get you audited, for example? Right? So where you have doctors, you have quacks. Where you have great sheikhs, you have great frauds. Um, wherever you have any sort of person that has social and other types of status because of their accomplishment, you're going to have people that imitate them. And so one of the major things in the development of the schools, the schools of law, now we're not talking about these people themselves, is exactly that. Some people would say the schools of law begin when they can put down criteria for qualification. When they can authorize a great sheikh as a great sheikh. So this is one of the ways they did it traditionally, that you have authorization. And they would say that, yes, you may be a great sheikh, but we know, in fact, that you are. We have tested you, uh, and we now endorse you. This is really important because it also means that the school begins to come into a certain conformity, right? Conformity with certain standards. However, in all traditions, uh, there were things that went beyond that. So, for example, in Sufism, the Sufis used to say that the worst people you can ever meet are whom? They said there are three people. They're the worst people you can ever meet and ever be around in your life. They'll mess up your whole life. Who were those three people? Sufis. Ignorant Sufis, they would say. Ignorant Sufis. And hypocritical reciters of the Qur'an. And tyrannical rulers. That if you, Those three are deadly poison. So, with the Sufis, if you read Sufi literature, one of the fundamental concerns of the Sufi is the false Sufi. The fraud. The quack. You know, the charlatan. And every Sufi book will tell you about the false sheikh. And they will also tell you, how do you know the real sheikh? One of the things they will say, for example, is, Beware of the maker of claims. When you have a man or a woman making claims, I am this, I am that, you know, uh, they say, back off, because this is very dangerous. The real people don't make claims. Imam Malik made no claims. Imam Abu Hanifa made no claims. The Shafi'i, Ahmad, they made no claims. The great Sufis, they don't make claims. People make claims about them, but they themselves don't. Yes, Imam Malik would say, I'm not very good at what I do. That's his claim. He would say, most of the questions I'm asked, I don't know the answer to. You see, so this is really important. And the same applies to a muhaddith, the same applies to almost anything. A doctor, right? You know, how do you know that a doctor is not a quack? Well, we have to have standards. But this is why also it's really important, you know, for a Muslim, you know, never to close your eyes. You know, because uh, once you begin to submit to authority blindly, then you do get in trouble. You do get in trouble. You know, you, you no know, person has a right to tell you that you can't look at me, you can't criticize me. We believe as Muslims that you should do it politely. You know, so that there's a, there's a nice way to go about that. There's a rude way. 
But nevertheless, you don't ever take things on blind authority. And usually in the past, people tested people. Uh, Ahmad ibn Idris, who was one of the greatest Sufi sheikhs and one of the most brilliant scholars of his age. I mean, almost every time that he met with another scholar, he had to be tested. It's like they've got to ask him about some word that nobody knows. They've got to ask him about some ruling or some hadith. And, and then he's got to prove it. He has to prove that he actually knows it. Very good question. Imam al-Nawi wasaf al-Imam al-Nawi al-Sufiya fi adkarihi. So in, in the famous book Al-Adkar, Imam al-Nawi spoke about the Sufis. As-sadatu al-ajillatu min safwati hadi al-umma ahli tarbiyat al-sarikin wa ta'adib al-murabbin. So he said that they were the sada of this umma. You know, they're the highest group. Uh, Al-ajilla, these majestic, uh, uh, masters. Min safwati hadi al-umma, from the best of this umma. Ahli tarbiyat al-sadikin, they're the people that help people on the path to God by getting better. With ta'adib al-murabbin, and they discipline the souls of others. Uh, with their insight. Now this has to be understood in the context because this is a contested term. Sufism, tasawwuf, is a contested term. Sufism is not what you see in, in many countries in the Muslim world today. In fact, the Sufis would be the first people to reject them. Imam al-Ghazali in his book, at tabyin uh, he wrote a, a small treatise called at tabyin uh, elucidating the fact that the vast majority of creation are complete, uh, is completely deluded. And when he gets to the last section, he says, the, Suf the Sufis. And he said, and, and how great is their delusion? He said, they're deluded in their dress. They're deluded in the way they talk. They're deluded in, the, in their thinking that they're the elite of God and the elect. So, remember that many of the people that were part of this tradition, they were great critics. And they, they also, some of them say that the Sufiya and the Mutasawifa are different. Some use these, these terms technically. The Mutasawifa are the people that pretend to be Sufis. And in fact, they have a term in the, in the tradition called the Mutamawits. The Mutamawit is somebody who's like a, he's acting like a spiritual person because he thinks this is how a spiritual person should be. And so he's pretending to be dead. In other words, like his ego is dead and he has certain qualities. He's very hushed, but he's meanwhile like tricking and doing all these things to. So one of the Mauritanians said, Asha bi halqawmu bi khayri isha fasuyyarat min ba'dihim ma'isha. يدعى الذي يمشي عليه السارق والسارق هل يوم حزب هالك that عاش بها القوم you know the قوم these are the قوم the صوفية they were called the قوم هم القوم لا يشقى بهم جريسهم they are the people because when the angels found the circle of ذكر they said there was one person he wasn't from them but he was sitting with them he said and and Allah says to the angels هم القوم لا يشقى بهم جريسهم they are the people that even if you sit with them you're in a good state so he says that these are people that But it became a means of getting livelihood after that. It became a means of, you know, selling talismans and doing these things like, and, and the Pir Saab who, uh, you know, uh, gets the poor people and convinces them, um, you know, that support me and all your ailments will go away and I'm going to get jinn out of you. Ah, I can see there's a jinni in you and just give me five minutes and I'll, you know, do some mumbo jumbo and it'll all go away. Uh, there's a lot of this in our ummah, right? Seriously. And so we can't be naive about these things. I mean, I, there was one person that you know, came to our area and he made all these claims. That's what the first thing. If they make claims, big red flag. That's the first thing. If they tell you, like, somebody came to me and said, I've got this 
her person, our city, he doesn't pray Juma at the masjid. You know, he came from, I won't name the country, and he said, he says he prays, uh, uh, Juma with the Prophet at his house, right? <laughs> you know, and a lot of people were like really taking this man seriously. And I said, I just said, you know, he's a kadab. Just a liar. Don't, don't believe him. The Prophet said, first of all, I don't think he'd be praying in England, Juma. <laughs> because most of the fuqah say Juma doesn't even apply in foreign countries without an imam, because that's one of the conditions to establish Juma. I mean, Sheikh Sa'id Ramadan used to play, pray Juma and then pray Dhuhr afterwards, because they didn't consider the Juma valid in Syria. People don't know that, because there was no legitimate government by Sharia. Right? So, yeah, I just, anyway, I'll, I'll, and I don't have a problem telling people that. I don't believe that. You know, I had somebody come to me, you know, we do this dhikr on Thursdays, and this one guy, he's, every day he said the prophet's in the circle, and, and he comes to him in his dreams, and he tells him what dhikrs they should do. You know, and I, for me, those, that, that's just red flags all over the place. I don't want anything to do with those people. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. These are people that, you know, the, the, the real, the people that I knew never talked about any of those things. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, somebody asked him, he actually once said, you know, that he didn't want to see the Prophet in a dream because he would be so ashamed. Like, who am I to see the Prophet in him? <laughs> you know, that's the people I knew. See Fadul al-Huwari, Habib Ahmed Mashhur al-Haddad. These people were people of no claims. No claims. So people that do that, that tell you, oh, I saw the Prophet and I saw this and that. Now people can genuinely see the Prophet and we're going to get to that inshallah, I think. And, 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 and there can be a bushra in that. But if you do see the Prophet sallam, keep that to yourself. That's my advice. It's a very special thing and you should just keep it to yourself. If you want to share it with somebody very special that it has to do with them or you want to tell somebody that might know something about dream interpretation, that's another thing, but I would not put that on Facebook. You know, and if you hear a sheikh saying, "I saw the prophet," and he said, "Support CC," or something like that, and then no, I'm sorry. You know.